Hello, everyone. My name is Quentin Ring. Uh, on behalf of Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center, I wanted to welcome you to A Night of Love, our tribute to the great Bell Hooks, who passed away uh, just at the end of last year. Uh, our host for the evening, Shonda Buchanan, has gathered an extraordinary collection of writers, including Kim Benjamin, Pam Ward, F. Douglas Brown, Derek Weston Brown, Pat Payne, and Amani Thompson Jones, to read and discuss Hooks' legacy as a poet, intellectual, feminist, and activist. I can't wait to hear from all of them um, in just a moment. Before we get started, though, I wanted to say a few words about Beyond Baroque. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge Beyond Baroque's presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. We acknowledge the wrong done to these peoples through settler colonialism, genocidal practices, and the violent dispossession of their land. As an arts organization, we are committed to uplifting indigenous writers and communities. As many of you know, Beyond Baroque is a literary space in Venice, California, and we are dedicated to the artistic possibilities of language through cultivating new writing, presenting, presenting contemporary literature and art, and building a diverse literary community. I'm very pleased to say that after two years of being largely closed due to the pandemic, we are reopening our doors for regular <laughs> events on March 18th. Please do check our website for more information about that. Uh, before then, we do have a couple of events I'd like to flag for your attention. Uh, this Thursday, March 3rd, we have a virtual event uh, and a reading and discussion featuring Teresa Carmody, Jan Janice Lee, and Thierry Mio Kya Mint, focused on the relationship between spiritual practices and narrative forms. Uh, the event is in celebration of Janice Lee's new novel, Imagine a Breath, Imagine, Imagine a Death. Uh, she's brilliant, and I hope you'll check it out. Uh, on March 5th, we have an intensive workshop with the poet Douglas Manuel called Cruising Through Forms. There's more than the sonnet. Uh, Doug's, a fabulous, Doug's a fabulous poet and teacher, so I think it will be well worth your time. Uh, finally, on March 10th, we're co-presenting your reading and discussion with Urban Word featuring Mahogany Brown and Tanya Ingram. Um, that should be a great event as well. I've never seen a reading with Mo Brown that wasn't absolutely killer, so please, uh, please do tune in for that also. I also mentioned that Beyond Baroque recently launched the Amanda Gorman Future Voices Poetry Prize, which will provide $10,000 in scholarship and contest money to young poets of color uh, in this year. Amanda got her start at, in Beyond Baroque's workshops, and we're hoping to honor her legacy and support the next generation of young poets of color through this, through this scholarship and uh, contest program. Um, we would really appreciate it uh, if all of you in the audience would consider spreading the word to anyone who might be interested in applying to it. Uh, you can find more information on our website. Uh, and in the chat as well, um, as well as information about all the programs I just mentioned uh, a minute ago. Um, so this has been a very difficult and long two years. Uh, as a result of the pandemic, Beyond Baroque has suffered numerous challenges, uh, financial losses. As we get ready to reopen, we are very much in need of your help. So please do consider making a donation to us uh, as part of this event. It's a great help to us and the work we do. You'll find a link to our donation page in the chat. Um, even more so, uh, I would really appreciate it if you consider supporting our readers by buying their books. Uh, we'll have a link in the chat as well. Um, and we'll also have a selection of Bell Hooks writings available there also. Um, so let's turn to our program. Um, this is the very end of Black History Month. Next month is Women's History Month. And I'd say there's no better time to celebrate Bell Hooks, uh, who made a profound difference in the way all of us understand race, womanhood, and the intersections between the two. Uh, this program is the third in a series celebrating Black women writers. Um, that series was conceived and has been organized by one of really one of the most impressive people I know, Shonda Buchanan. Um, Shonda is a Pushcart Prize nominee, a USC Los Angeles Institute of the Humanities Fellow, and a Department of Cultural Affairs City of Los Angeles Master Artist Fellow. Um, she is the author of five books, including the award-winning memoir, Black Indian, uh, she was also recently unanimously elected the president of Beyond Baroque's Board of Trust Trustees, Trustees, where she has been instrumental in conceiving and launching the Amanda Gorman Future Voices Poetry Prize and helping us to re rebuild and reorganize after the pandemic. Um, Shonda is our host for this evening, so I think without further ado, I'm just going to turn it over to her. Thank you all so much for being here, and Shonda, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Quentin. I'm incredibly grateful to you for your support. Uh, of everything that we're doing, particularly of what I am now calling the Black Women's Writers Series at Beyond Baroque. I'm launching this as our inaugural reading. Uh, so thank you, Quentin. Thank you to everyone who made this event, uh, our tribute to Bell Hooks possible. Definitely to our behind the scenes 
uh, people, Ivan and Jimmy, uh, you all have just been fantastic dealing with our, you know, our tech issues and just, you know, uh, Ivan with, you know, emailing our panelists and just putting this together and other programs for Beyond Baroque together. I'm so grateful to you. So thank you. Uh, I am honored to host and moderate this event as the new president of the Board of Trustees at Beyond Baroque. And we have such a fantastic board. Uh, hopefully at one point, one of the programs that we can organize is a reading of past and present board members. That's something else that I haven't talked to Quentin about, but we have such talented board members. So we'll so look out for that in the future. Um, and what an appropriate event to herald my time as president. Uh, so again, this is our third event in the Black Women's Writer Series. Our first event was a powerful home going for Intazaki Shange, uh, illustrious, powerful writer who contributed to uh, so many things you know, with her work, but particularly uh, with the work for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough or enough. Uh, also, the second tribute was for Toni Morrison, our illustrious grand, grand mother. And I always say that Toni Morrison changed the lexicon for what it meant to be a Black woman in America with her works, everything from um, The Bluest Eye to her, her last books, but also, of course, her critical books as well, Playing in the Dark, Whiteness and the Literary Imagination. Uh, just so many books that gave us uh, our images and, and our strength and our tenacity, and then also allowed for those spaces where we could be vulnerable and we could be weak and we could just be tired. Uh, so she gave us so many different facets of what it meant to be a Black woman. And it is the same for Bell Hooks, the same for the work that she has brought to us over the years. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about uh, bell hooks when I do my official introduction, but I, I know just in, in writing my, um, my intro and just talking about these women, I'm always thinking what big shoes that I and we have to fill when we look at, at the scope of the women who have come before us, the Black women writers who have come before us. So I'd like to introduce this, uh, the event by reading the bios of our other panelists. And I just wanna say thank you to everyone because you are in for a treat. Uh, the panelists that we have today will knock your socks off. So let me go ahead and read. And the way that we'll do this is I'll read the bios and then I will come in with my piece about um, Bell Hooks and how she impacted my life. Uh, and then we'll go on with our, our next readers. And we're, we're gonna do this a little differently than what um, some of the events you might have um, attended online. We're gonna hold what we call a kind of a, a church. So it'll be reader to reader to reader, which is why I'm going to go ahead and give you their bios first, because I want to tell you all of the wonderful things that everyone has done and will be doing. Uh, Dr. Kim Benjamin is an educator who specializes in teaching, reading for Los Angeles Unified School District. Her dissertation, The Intentional Love of a Black Woman for Her Son, explores systematic failures within educational, judicial, and healthcare systems, and is informed by such works as Bell Hooks's trilogy, All About Love, New Visions, and Salvation, Black People and Love, and also Communion, the female search for love. The foundation of her work, her writing, and her activism as a teacher and mother is grounded on the notion of love as ammunition and fortification against social hostilities. So that is Dr. Kim Benjamin's bio. The next reader that we will have this evening is Pam Ward. Pam Ward recently released her poetry book, Between Good Men and No Man at All, uh, released from the World Stage Press in 2022. Author of two novels, Want Some, Get Some, and Bad Girls Burn Slow. Uh, Pam Ward is also a California Arts Council Fellow and a Pushcart nominee. And her poetry has appeared in Calix, Sharon, the Santa Monica, Re Monica Review, Voices of Lamert Park, uh, the Los and the Los Angeles Times. Her multimedia show, I Didn't Survive Slavery for This, exclamation point was a poetic riff on life post-emancipation. 
daughter of Watts Library Architect, a UCLA graduate, and Art Center instructor designer, Pam's writings sings of her beloved city in prismatic color. The next reader, F. Douglas Brown, is the author of two collections of poetry, ICON, Icon, by Writ Large Press that was published in 2018 and also Zero to Three published by the University of Georgia in 2014. Winner of the 2013 Cave Canem Poetry Prize, selected by U.S. Poet Laureate Tracy K. Smith. He also co-authored with poet Jeffrey Davis Begotten. A chapbook of poetry is a part of the Floodgate Poetry Series. Brown, an educator for over 20 years, currently teaches English and African-American poetry at Loyola High School of Los Angeles, an all-boys Jesuit school. He is both a Cave Canem and a Kundeman Fellow and was selected by poet, poets and writers as one of their top notable debut poets in 2014. His poems have appeared in the Academy of American Poets, the PBS NewsHour, the Virginia Quarterly, to name a few, many, many, many places he has been published. He is also co-founder and curator of Unfatable, the Requiem for Sandra Bland, a quarterly reading series examining restorative justice through poetry as a means to address racism. Another reader, Derek Weston Brown, holds an MFA from American University. He is the founder of Poet in Residence of Busboys and Poets in Washington, DC, and a graduate of, Cave, of the Cave Canem and Vona workshops. His work has been published in Color Lines and Tidal Basin Review. His work, his first collection of poems, Wisdom Teeth, was released in 2011 by PM Press. His second collection, on All Fronts was published by Upper Rubber Boot Press in March 2019, and he reside, resides in Mount Rainer, Maryland. And then we have two more bios. Uh, Pat Payne, aka The Velvet Hammer, is an omni-creative artist who enjoys creating stunning works of beauty in any and all mediums and disciplines. She is a Caribbean American multimedia installation performance artist, poet, visual artist, reluctant shaman, entrepreneur, and self-avowed troublemaker. Payne is also the reigning Taos Poetry Circuit heavyweight champion, a founding member, member of the Neil Spinster's Poetry Troupe, and a former member of the San Diego-based troupe, the Taco Shop Poets. Her one-woman shows and poetry have been presented at venues, including Red Cat, the, LA's, the LA Women's Theater Festival, Calgary Ban Banff Poetry Festival, the Eurekans Poets Cafe, University of Sterling, Edinburgh, and Beyond Baroque, and I'm sure many more. And our last reader, yes, I love that, The Velvet Hammer. Our last reader will be, and I'm going to pull up her bio. Perfect. Okay, awesome. Okay, Amani Thompson Jones is a poet and scholar whose work explores Black girlhood, visual theory, Black feminist studies. Amani, Amani is a PhD candidate in the Department of Feminist Studies at U, UC Santa Barbara. Amani holds an MA in feminist studies from UCSB. Prior to UCSB, she graduated Phi Beta Kappa, I better not get that wrong, Phi Beta Kappa, with a BA in Comparative Women's Studies and a minor in Creative Writing. Uh, oh, wonderful, a historically Black women's college in Atlanta, Georgia. She was also a recipient of the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellow Fellowship. Amania grew up in Lumberton, North Carolina, and is continually shaped by the rich creative traditions of her home in the Black rural South. Her dissertation explores how Black girls' visual and material cultures demonstrate the value of the interior, self-possession, and Black womanhood. So we've got an amazing roster tonight. Okay, so let us begin. Let us begin with honoring Bell Hooks. In 1978, 20-year-old Gloria Watkins, who wrote under the name Bell Hooks, which she took on as a tribute to her grandmother. 
She has published over 30 books in her lifetime, crafting her sociopolitical treaties on education, love, Black masculinity, Black woman sexuality, and so much more. Yet her very, very first book was a little known collection of eight poems, and there we wept, a small but powerful chapbook with only 250 copies in circulation. I'm extremely lucky to own a copy of this book because it set the precedent for the next 49 years of Hook's searing, loving, and penetrating gaze on race, feminism, sexism, love, compassion, scholarship, rage, and everything between. In this book, her words were like copper bangles on the delicate wrists of graceful dancers, learning her craft, a hearkening, teaching me as a poet that I could be both fire and educator. We could equally adore and challenge social, cultural, historical paradigms in which we have existed that have denied the Black woman's voice. So now I'm going to read a poem from her book so you can hear what she was writing about as a 20 year old in 1968. Oh, 78, my apologies. This one is called The Bloody Ground. The Bloody Ground. We trod the bloody ground. Our feet searched the path for a new land. The bodies of our dead await this coming. Dressed in the rituals, costumes of the motherland, we go to greet them, recalling their native tongue. The rhythm beat into the drum, beat into our soul. So the drum in us moves a throbbing heartbeat inside a weary people seeking home. Two, home is not Africa. Home is not the dark land where once we rested safe in the womb of our mothers. We dream this land knowing strangers across the water. We recognize color and see them a reflection of our origins, but strangers still. Not even small recollections of love long past unite us. Three, I live in America the man in the shadows, the woman pushing the baby cart in summer. I imagine hell is, a is also a place where things grow and flourish, where there is beauty. And so the dead walk, we pass them by with laughter so polite and modest are our, our, our ways. I remind no one, my skin is black. So this was one of the first books that um, introduced me to bell hooks uh, at the beginning of her, her writing, but then also it just set up a sense for me that I needed to pay attention and I needed eventually to bring her to my class when I taught at Hampton University. And so this was another pivotal book for me, Teaching to Transgress, Education as the Practice of Freedom. And at the time, I had no idea that, that we could talk uh, both in poetic form and then also as an academician about Black womanhood and the, what happened in the past and love and, and sacrifice and these kinds of things. And Bell Hooks showed me that. So one of the poems that I'm going to read tonight is a poem which I believe is inspired by Bell Hooks and Toni Morrison and Intazaki Shange. Uh, and my poem is called Black Woman Down. And I have as the, um, the subtitle for Brianna Taylor, Nia Wilson, Latasha Harlins, Eula May Love, Sandra Bland, and all my sisters who have crossed over unnecessarily. Uh, and then the list grows, unfortunately. But I'm going to go ahead and read my poem, Black Woman Down. The Breath. Sycamore spores and black girlhood calcified in a copper memory. Inhale. Touch the bruise until it fades into a place never to be seen again. Mama, pour all your blood into a thimble and top it off with, why daddy always beaten me? And when she grew up, 
shake that money maker. And so she did. The breath is a swollen kiss in the eye of a tornado, black woman. Breath is a copperhead snake under your stairs, black girl. Breath is 13 children that push themselves out of your body like beautiful bloody fists. But the black girl, child, woman, sister, aunt, cousin, grandmother is still breathing. We are still breathing. The breath in each instance, it is the thing we need most and the thing we take for granted and the thing that ultimately will kill us all the middle passage breath, the concubine breath, the they killed my son, my daughter for no reason breath, and I am returned. I am writing with my eyes closed in a slave ship in the hull, Portuguese slaver on top of me. I am releasing my spirit. I am out of body to survive this. I am writing on the salt water, writing to the shark, gazing at us to save me. I am writing with my eyes closed, seeing the granddaughter born of his blood, but not his name, not his country. I am breathing, unpeeled, a historical footnote, a lost moccasin, broken teeth rattling in me, the breath is my childhood running in a grassy meadow then dancing on pimento seeds, but I will not die here. I will not die here. The breath is a beast ravaging through the body caverns like dragonflies in love. And the breath is sugar water rolling through a black woman's body until we sleep the breath is your black child asking you to keep your black power opinions to yourself. The breath is a river crashing into the mountainside until the hole is large enough for history to come through. The breath is Latasha Harlan's reaching for the orange juice. The breath is Sandra Bland's rope silently singing. The breath is Eula May Love dropping the knife and turning. The breath is Brianna Taylor sleeping in her bed, sleeping. The breath is eight bullets, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight silver kisses ending her dreaming. The breath is a tree wishing away the noose, the chainsaw, the white gaze. The breath is a black woman down. But I, we will not die here. Exhale, however many generations it takes, you still fold into the pain of loving men again and again, the surviving of a society that does not love you back, the birthing of them, the giving everything away, the dying, the coming back to life, the breath, the breathing, the breath. Black woman, the door is always open. And yet we, I, will not die here. Thank you. And next we have Dr. Kim Benjamin. You know, you do. You know, I have to breathe a little bit after that. Thanks, my sister, Inyesha, Shonda. Oh, this is feeling like church already. I'm feeling home. That's absolutely beautiful. Keep your Black power opinions to yourself. Let me just repeat that one more time. Keep your black power opinions to yourself. <sighs> Taking it all in. Thanks so much. I'm grateful to be here. It's an honor to pay tribute to Bell Hooks. Um, I'm an educator and mother who writes. That's just what I do. I'm here to really talk about the power and importance that Bell Hooks conveys she consistently worked towards an understanding of love and that is directly um, in alignment with what I did with my dissertation I feel like she took love and she watched it she touched it she picked it up she looked at it sideways I feel like she held it up to see if it sparkled in the sun I, I feel like she took it into her bedroom at night turned off the lights to see if it glowed she opened it up she smelled it she tasted it and then she passed it on to the rest of us you could tell by the way she wrote that she considered love in every way to do it 
this is exactly what I felt when I first discovered her. I was about 23 when I bought my first Bell Hooks book. I think it was at the Aquarian Bookstore on Western and King. Those of you who are from LA, y'all might know what I'm talking about, but it was a little um, bookshop that, you know, spoke to us in our community. And I believe that's where I first picked, her, picked it up. I don't know if I knew who she was, but I knew when I saw the title, Talking Back, that I had to pick it up. I went ahead, picked it up, and then, of course, after browsing the page, pages, I couldn't put it down. She was speaking directly to me. I've always written in journals and notebooks to myself, quietly at home, never talking too much. I was a quiet girl in the corner with the book. So when I read Bell Hooks, I felt like... Uh, what Roberta Flack might have felt like when she wrote that uh, she found my letters and read each one out loud. That's what I felt Bell Hicks had done to me. Like, who's this woman who knows so much about who I am? Um, in talking back, this is, this is what she, she wrote. I'm going to read this from her book. For me, poetry was the place for the secret voice for all that could not be directly stated or named, for all that would be denied expression. Poetry was privileged speech, simple at times, but never ordinary. The magic of poetry was transformation. It was words changing shape, meaning, and form. Poetry was not mere recordings of the way we Southern Black folks talk to one another even though our language was poetic, it was transcendent speech. It was meant to transform consciousness, to carry the mind and heart to a new dimension. These were my primitive thoughts on poetry as I experienced and knew it growing up. That was Bell Hooks talking to me at 23. She tapped me on the shoulder and she had me ever since. She knew me and she basically was telling me to be myself. Later, after having children, there was she was again. She gave me the love trilogy, the all about love, new visions, the salvation, black people in love, and the third one, communion, the female search for love. As I read these, I watched myself connecting the docs with every passage. So much was right on point. She was the one that made me consider love as a verb, an act or action, separate from the notion of love. Basically, she was asking me, how do you love? What does your love do? Every time with every, of course, I have three children, for those of you who don't know, but with every child, every day of my life, I had to ask myself, what does my love do? How is my love shaping them? How is it lifting them? How is it guiding them into the space that they need to be? This is what Bell Hooks did for me. She directly influenced my own work of love, my dissertation that speaks to the intentional love and loving our sons in a socially hostile environment. It's because of her that I became as active as I did as a parent, as an educator, and continue to do so. Sister, I like to call her sister, she is a doctor, but Sister Bell Hooks had me moving through my daily life as a mother and then wife and now whatever I am, always asking, how am I loving? December 15th was the day I saw the text. And the first thing I remember was that book, Talking Back how I dog-eared the chapters. I had it highlighted, it was underlined, it was pin marked, I had un a Hans through it, I had exclamation marks. And funny enough, I would carry it as a flight attendant. I would carry it so people could see it because I wanted people to see what I was reading. I wanted them to know that, yeah, read this. I know something, y'all, and y'all need to catch up. So I would walk through the airport with my book in my hand, making sure that I was catching eyes on the way through. So December 15th, I went back and read a little bit more of Talking Back. And I underlined again and again. And this passage right now, I'm going to share with you because this speaks to exactly who she helped me become. In Talking Back, Bell Hooks writes, those passages where I was speaking most directly to Black women 
contained the voice I felt to be most truly mine. It was then that my voice was daring and courageous. When I thought about the audience, the way in which language we choose to use declares who it is we place at the center of our discourse. I confronted my fear of placing myself and other Black women at the speaking center. Writing this book was for me a radical gesture. It not only brought me face to face with this question of power, it forced me to resolve this question, to act, to find my voice, to become that subject who could place herself and those like her at the center of feminist discourse. I was transformed in consciousness and being. This was the passage I read, and this is the passage that still resonates. Bell Hooks challenges us to share honestly. She challenges us to speak to who we are, why we are. She honors it, she lifts it. When I write, I try to write to heal. I see myself clearly, I find my way back and I let it go. I try to write courageously and I try to write, write to women who understand my experience, who need to hear my experience. And from that center, I can affect those people around me. So this poem I'm about to read is truly that. It's my exercise of self-love. It is me being honest and speaking to those women who share the sentiment. It's called self-love. Today is my day off. So I will dig into yesterday's center, cry, scream, curl into fetal, ache, wrench, rest, spill from my mouth, bleed from my bowels, soil the space beneath and around me, lie in it and weep. No drink or smoke or inhale or inject or snort or rub into my skin. All my fuck use to the world sober. In the corner of this room, under that bed, in this closet, behind that door, under this rug, I'm between Gary Clark's verses of that's all you get and I don't owe you a thing. Today, the car doesn't have to start. The tire can be flat, my window can crack, the pipes can leak, my cilantro can wither, my cucumbers can fail, my dog can gnaw on the molding, the ants can evade my space, my nigga can leave me today. My kids can say I hate you under their breath or out loud. All y'all can. Blame me for every fucked up thing in the world. I own that shit. They are birth stories carried on my back. This is my fucking day off. This is me not doing anything. This is me laid flat out in how much I love myself. And while this is not the last line of the poem, this is me giving thanks for the brilliant bell hooks, for the encouragement to be courageous, for speaking to us from a place of love and challenging us to find ourselves. Thank you, bell hooks, sister, mother, doctor, friend. She inspires us to be better people. And with that, I call tag, tag uh, to my friend, girl, Pam Ward. Come on, come with it, Pam. Just ow! I just have to say that, Kim. Ow! <laughs> You're on mute, Pam. Now I'm on. All right. So I read Bell Hooks, all about love, Sisters of the Yam, which inspired several poetry groups in LA. And what I liked about Belle was her fierceness in allowing us to define ourselves. Um, just telling us to do so was an act of love. And I'm just gonna read a little piece that she wrote in All About Love, um, talking about self-assertiveness. Um, Sexual socialization teaches females that self-assertiveness is a threat to femininity. 
Accepting this faulty logic lays the groundwork for low self-esteem. The fear of being self-service usually serves as a women who've been trained to be good little girls, dutiful daughters. In our childhood home, my brother was never punished for talking back. Asserting his opinion was a positive sign of manhood. So she goes on to say that even though ours is a patriarchal household, female, her females outnumbered the males. And that's what happened in my household, that even though my dad was really strong and I had a brother, I also had two other sisters counting me, which is three plus mom. So that was four to two. And we kind of, we, we let him think he was running the show. So um, she also mentioned something um, uh, called, well, okay, so this assertiveness, I'll read a poem that I wrote that um, reminded me of how assertive Josephine Baker was back in, you know, way back in the 20s. So this is called Le Revue Negri for Josephine Baker. Before Baldwin lifted a suitcase and before Chesterheim escaped, Josephine packed her bags and skipped off to France, severing ties with America, an umbilical cord strangling her neck. She boarded a ship and bailed the US, like bailing the backhand of a bad, brutal marriage. This Nubian princess, this queen of the bait and switch, had everyone going bananas, examining how yellow fruit curves, dancing nude except for her produce section skirt, 15 gyrating, penis-shaped, smiling grins, happily tapping that ass. While everyone studied her circumference, which defied gravity and physics, dreaming of banana nut bread, banana pudding or banana splits. Josephine hid Nazi secrets on sheet music or brassieres or the ticklish part of her panties. This doll face, this Venus, this St. Louis tease became the biggest star in Europe, twerking galatial hips living so large, so vast, so spread, eagle wide, Saturn dropped her skirt and slow drag with Mars, causing Pluto to yell, I got next. Josephine lived so big, clothes couldn't hold her back. Boogaloing in her birthday suit, refusing to kowtow or bow, except for her seventh, her 10th, her 12th curtain call, hula hoop until the sun beamed up, or like bloomers fell back south, tearing London, Paris, Rome, or Berlin, showing the whole world how black girls got down. Not with dust mops, not in aprons, not the back of the bus, but infelicity untethered, living high on the hog, buying a chateau so east of the West's ugly mess, firebombs, German shepherds, the strange fruit strung on trees, courtesy of Uncle Sam's welcoming committee. And as the zookeepers of America gawked or angrily shook their fists, Lady Liberty did a two-step and shimmied by the sea, forcing her worn out gown, lifting her teal, she screamed, I see you over there, Josephine. Go on, girl, get it, get it and way across the pond, nibbling bonbons, ordering prawns, sipping endless flutes of vu or moe champagne. The electric slide goddess blew a kiss to her rusty friend, mon chéri, you need to come back with me. And all the gorillas back in Africa, eating Shakitas, beating their chest, doing their best Josephine between branches and leaves, dancing a cha-cha, trotting a rumba, tossing peels in the street, gripping J-shaped fruit in their palms like a spear, honoring all escapees, praying for those still caged, remembering the black girl, the one with gumption, the nude immigre who had the mendacity to leave her country, little Miss Polly Lou Francais, 
a black woman who ran from home sharing her clothes, shoes, and hair, severing herself completely, sailing far, far away, a gold star lighting the way. Thank you very much. So another theme of um, Bell Hooks was something that she called the observational gaze and um, the oppositional gaze, sorry, oppositional. First coined by her in 1992 in an essay called Black Looks, Race and Representation. And in this, she's talking about the rebellion and resistance against repression that black people have just by looking, just by looking up. I mean, we've known people that they call that reckless eyeballing where people were murdered in the street. And so um, the way blackness is othered and I felt as a poet that we had to acknowledge that um, oppositional gaze with oppositional poetry. And there was a lot of backlash over the, the, the name Karen. And I wrote this poem called Say Her Name. We used to call her Miss Ann. Some call her Becky. Bossy little cuss who tossed shoes at our head. The kind of hatchet face who sold us down river. Today we say Karen with a capital KKK. These fraudulent little cunts pop up once a week, demanding to speak to the manager, flapping antebellum tongues with their fake tears, fake traumatized Avon lies, igniting hate crimes as wide as all 50 states till no man with a suntan was safe. Karen's call the cops with the drop of a hat. Black kids selling lemonade are jogging down the street our bird watching alone in the park on a lark, cause she crazy, or got crow magnum jeans. Here she go tattling, wagging that finger, weaponizing her pussy again, pushing her white privileged stank all up in our face, getting us lynched, tarred or feathered or burnt at the stake, all while feigning some fake ass distress. Don't believe me? Here's some Karen is shit for your ass. Karen Bryan had Emmett Till killed. Susan Smith said a black man did it. The Scottboro boys were almost lynched by some lion ass trick. And did I mention the Central Park kids? Some Karens have gone on to obliterate towns. Somebody say Tulsa. Somebody say Rosewood, please. See her muddy little feet? Hear those crocodile tears? There goes Karen playing the same role again, going for another Academy Award. And wait, stop complaining. Stop saying you hate the name. If Karen's the real victim, then go ahead, flip the script. How many black chicks call the cops and send white women to prison? Go ahead, Cinderella, I'm waiting. The Karen moniker marks a legacy of predatory terror. So if the shoe fits, then wear it. Thank you very much. That's my love poem to the black community. Okay, so that's what love's about. We have it here in between good men and no men. <laughs> thank you guys. And thank you, Shonda, AKA and Yesha. We know her from back in the day, back from the world stage days. Thank you for keeping it and hold it down for us. We need the poets in this and writers in this book, um, book banning thing. That's when we get stronger and rise up. Okay, because you can't keep the truth down. Somebody say amen, even if you're on mute. <laughs> amen. 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 We can unmute. Amen. Big tambourine over here. Yes. 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 <laughs> you got a lot of hallelujahs in the chat. <laughs> right? Oh, man. Yeah, keep blowing it up for Pam Ward and Dr. Benjamin. Oh. I didn't know I was going to be this emotional here with Shonda S. So I appreciate Shonda, my sister, for, for having me here. Um, and, and I've been a fan of Bell Hooks. I first uh, learned about Bell Hooks my senior year uh, in college. And um, 
I had a job before everybody else. Like it was like April or something. And I already had a teaching job lined up. And so I think I was walking around the campus just like kind of sliding through and some friends were going to see bell hooks and they're like, why don't you come with us? I'm like, okay. And I was just changed by that, uh, uh, that experience and um, just hearing her, seeing her. Uh, and she said something that I'm going to say to you later on uh, uh, that I've never forgotten that I always kept with me. And uh, that first year of teaching as most people who are teachers, you know, it's always just a hell, right? And hell uh, and a shit show coming out of my classroom. And I think at one point I, I, I wanted to give up. And then she came out with this book right here, right? The Teaching to Transgress. And she did a reading. I'm from San Francisco. She did a reading in San Francisco at Walter Mosley. And it was like at the time of the year that it really just, I needed it. I needed it. I was like, I need to go see Bell Hooks. And um uh, every Bell Hooks book I've owned, I've given away, and it kind of gave to, to people who needed it and, it, and it really, like, uplifted them, except this book. I bought their own for them of this book. I kept this one because Bell Hooks wrote to me, or she wrote like all writers do, like you all do, right? And she wrote Douglas. She called me by my first name, and she said, to the joy of teaching, you know, and at that point, I just remember there was no joy that I was doing, or I felt I was doing no joy. And then reading this book was like, no, you are doing a lot of joy. And, and, and she really honored the things that I was doing back then and that I still hold as a practice. So I'm going to read this, um, and then I'm going to read a poem or two. Uh, this is actually comes from Chapter 10, uh, Building a Teaching Community, uh, you know, I go back to this book and you think that, oh, yeah, I had this idea. No, man, you got that from Bell Hooks, son. Like, remember <laughs> that, you know. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to read this little passage here because uh, this is what I firmly embrace. And, and you can see, uh, you know, you substitute multiculturalism in here for CRT. You see how people coming out of this. Bell Hooks. To educate for freedom, then, we have to challenge and change the way everyone thinks about pedagogical process. This is especially true for students. Before we try to engage them in a dialectical discussion of ideas that is mutual, we have to teach about process. I teach many white students and they hold diverse political stances, yet they come into a class on African-American women's literature expecting to hear no discussion of politics of race, class, and gender. Often these students will complain, well, I thought it was a literature class. What they're really saying to me is, I thought this class was going to be taught like any other literature class I would take, only we would substitute black female writers for white male writers. They accept the shift in the locus of representation, but resist shifting ways they think about the ideas. That is threatening. That's why the critique of multiculturalism seems to shut the classroom down again. To halt this revolution is in, in how we know what we know. It's as though many people know that the focus on difference has to be the potential to revolutionize the classroom. And they do not want a revolution, or a revolution to take place. There is a major backlash that seeks to delegitimize progressive pedagogy by saying, this keeps us from having serious thoughts and, uh, and serious education. That critique returns us to the issues surrounding teaching differently. How do we cope with how we are perceived by our colleagues? I have actually had colleagues say to me, students seem to be enjoying your class. What are you doing wrong? So I love that uh, because yes, she gave us some permission and uh, I, I, I gave a presentation about my class. I teach African-American poetry and African-American studies. And, and somebody was like, oh, that's a real interesting approach there. And, and it came off to me like that. He's like, oh yeah, you must be doing something wrong because I'm doing it differently. Uh, and so 
one of the things that, that I always bring in uh, with bell hooks is uh, a love, a love for curse words, the wrong words, right? And, and most people I'm sure here have seen her and, and uh, she just gives you a healthy dose of curse words all the time in her lectures. And, and she said that night when I first saw her that, um, you know, she grew up in a household where curse words were treated like an art form. And I love that. And it made me really think back and honor my own family and the, and the words that they use or don't use um, uh, and, and treat it and bring that into my classroom and to do something and feel like I was doing something a little bit wrong. Uh, but I, what I was really doing was something that, and keeping it real with my students and, and they kept it real with me or they keep it real with me, they still do. So I wrote this poem here, um, you know, it's a new poem. So be kind. It's called Curse Word Love, AKA GDSOFB. And you can figure that one out by on your own. This is after bell hooks. Don't you love the way they flick and stick to the roof? Not in my mouth, but on actual shingles. Weatherproof, tough. They linger until the jump. Don't you love damnation when the tongue untames itself to piss, to, pu to spew flames? Sometimes heat has flavor wrapped as honor. My mother cared for her annotated Bible, drew lines in spiritual notes, part prayer, part plea, mapped as righteous lyric or God verse instructions for a stare down to behold or hold her own tongue in check. She never cursed, but her mom did. Grandma had enough fuel in the word fuck to make a rapper blush, to make a OG no sailor, you cuss like big mama. My pops shared the same glow of goddamn motherfuck and shit. Oh, dad, gone. Yet your delight in bright words that replace all words still rule or bend. Oh, dad, a flagrant fits an egalitarian dance and spin. Dance and spin, then spit a hus tangle in dad's teeth. I love you, God damn it. I love you. Thank you, thank you. And, and I'm just gonna read like just some sections of this last one. Um, the other thing, uh, again, one of those things like, I thought I was realizing this and then when Bell Hooks researched and talked about it, I was like, yes, okay. I can honor that. I, I just always, uh, in the classroom, I always am aware of my, my body and myself and the language that I do use uh, because I know uh, it's rare. It's rare that, that students might have a, a black teacher um, and, and one who is a poet and, and one who might be as careful with words uh, and you know they don't see me or understand me out in the world as often. And so, uh, I'm really careful about it, and and uh, and I try to, to let the things that I write about and the things that I do in my classroom really try to inform me in my everyday life too. And I and I know that that's directly from Belle and understanding what uh, what she lived and and how she wrote and like sometimes the, how the writing really even hurt her. Right. Um, one of the things that that uh, that happened a couple of years ago, uh, my sister. Uh, uh, and my and good friend, uh, Tracy uh, Kato Kiriyama, the poet, uh, they both had breast cancer at the same time and they both beat it. And the things that I learned from both of them, and, and I equate this to bell hooks too, is that uh, 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 this language, like language of violence that kind of tends to spew out of uh, male, uh, male, male teachers, especially, uh, I needed to stop that. I needed to stop and pay attention to not only my positionality and my, you know, who I was like physically in the classroom, but really like how my language was happening in the classroom and to them. 
And so, you know, I stopped saying things like, you know, uh, you kill two birds with one stone, right? You say these things and you're like, if you really think about what you're saying here and the students hearing that, uh, the language starts to really erupt into them. And if I could flip that script a little, maybe it would change them. This is called alternative language for transformation. Not tangled blood, no knots morphing and clinging cells to share and eat, not tissue, no percentages, no rates, nor a scale to kick around, no feet to shoot pink ribbons, not a bowed head anywhere to hang, hurt, or remove. No, you are not dead meat, not made up or in line for a makeover. And even though you like it, no need for oil or back rubs. There will not be a pepper tree full of juju or voodoo forest of free doses. No seance or prayers sent to stone or hard ears. No officer kick the habit. Not a thief tiptoeing, hands wet with wrong. And no, not a warrior. Their victories and defeats both measured by destruction. When you transform in this world, in this now, this the violence in your blood becomes two, per, two birds protecting a vision of what ought to be. Two birds singing on both sides of your back. A tattoo, the right forms wings as pointed teeth ingesting the grace, inhaling the good take, ink in flight and feather on the left, spreading to the sunrise, over shoulder and straight to the heart. Oh heart, send the soldiers to their downward homes so two birds can harmonize, not in a figure, not the blues, the whale well won't do, not in fear or mere invention. Two birds sing their bodies clean, sing the kill away and take the stones their rebel cells wield, sing seeds and expansion, fields of faith waving as far as the eye can see. Thank you everyone. Thank you Shonda so much and Beyond Baroque for having us all here. I'm gonna pass it over to my other Brown, my man, Derek. Thank you all, love. All right. Thank you, Cousin Douglas. Appreciate that. Um, wow. Um, and I, I also want to give my, you know, my thanks to Beyond Baroque and thank you, Shonda, and thank you, everyone. And it's nice to be, you know, a part of this fellowship, this church we're having today. So, and also to honor um, Bell Hooks. And um, very much like, like Douglas, I'm also uh, a teacher as well. I teach young poets. I teach at a, a performing art school in Washington, D.C. called New Kellington. And um, being in the classroom and also being maybe one of a few you know male teachers when uh i look at my students and i see especially when i look at the boys and how you know hip-hop is still very much a part you know of their life and my connection with bell hooks comes through the way of of hip-hop of of coming up you know in the in the period of uh you know when we talk about old school ll or even you know since it's la and wa you know, Compton's most wanted, you know, I could go through it, the Bay Area, all of that. But then also being the, the type of kid who had a, there was certain, there was certain hip hop that I liked and some of the harder stuff in particular, when it came to what was being said about women, I immediately felt some kind of way about it, but I didn't have the language to say, uh, that's not cool. And again, you know, being a young teenage boy among other kids and boys and such, you know, speaking out against something that everybody was listening to, that could be a problem, you know, especially in the representation of the last thing you wanted to be in at any point, 80s, 90s was the term soft, soft being tender or soft being seen as you can't defend yourself and that type of thing. So already when I connected with Bell Hooks the first time, it was through not directly through Bell Hooks books, but um, we could talk about um, Joan Morgan's When Chicken Heads Come Home to Roost and understanding what that means with hip hop and feminism, which at the time I was like, how does that work? And Bell Hooks' name comes up. I keep seeing this name in lowercase letters. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. 
I don't know what that's about, but okay. And then eventually I, I had a friend um, who went to high school together and she was one of those sisters who was reading stuff way ahead of, of, of all of us. Uh, you may know her as um, uh, Tressy McMillan Cotton. And we went to high school together and she was carrying around bell hooks. And all I remember is seeing that book and knowing Tressy was very outspoken and being like, I don't know what's in that book, but uh, I don't know if I'm ready for that just quite yet. But um, the book that really pulled me fully, fully into uh, Bell Hooks, I have to shout out Mark Anthony Neal. He has his book, New Black Men, which is about the radical vision of what masculinity is. And at that time it was like, wait, there's more than one way, you know, to, to be masculine or what is masculinity? And we can, we can change it and define it. And so that definitely led me to Bell Hooks. And so when I was working at a nonprofit bookstore at Bus Boys and Poets called Teaching for Change, where we, uh, that was our, our, our goal was to bring books that we had Bell Hooks' book, you know, Teaching to Transgress. And then I got my hands on We Real Cool, which takes us into the opening line of um, Gwendolyn Brooks's poem. And that just set it off for me. And so I think about the chapters specifically from angry boys to angry men, waiting for daddy to come home, black male parenting and doing the work of love. And that really is kind of like my epicenter. So when it comes to black male parenting and then also waiting for daddy to come home, I have this poem and me being a poet, I think this kind of ex explains how I understand where I am in, in my involvement with masculinity and how bell hooks helped me lean into that. So this is called Legacy. My father's vocabulary is quite extensive, but he still can't find the words for I love you, nor the synonyms, acronyms, or abbreviations. I guess this is why I am a poet. I inherited the words lost to his dictionary. I am the next volume updated. I am the New Testament. And so that's for dad. And that's kind of like the lead into some of the sections that um, I really like about the chapters that um, from this book that really stuck out to me. So I'll just read this last part about um, Bell Hooks talking about her father in, his, in the elder phase of his life. Um, in the elder phase of his life, my dad has become an important, loving parental caregiver for his grandchildren and great grandchildren. He provides the emotional care that he did not give his own children when we were young. As he has aged, he has become more aware of the importance of emotional bonding. Seeing this emotional development in my black in a black male patriarch restores my hope. It lets me correctly see that it is never too late for black fathers to do the work of love and parenting. Dad has been changed by doing this work. He has opened the heart that patriarchal manhood told him would stay forever, close forever. He is the living embodiment of the feminist message that when males do the work of parenting, they do the work of becoming whole, bringing together parts of themselves, patriarchy demanded that they sever. They learn to laugh, play, and express emotions. They learn the language of forgiveness and tenderness. They speak sweet words. They become more like those, fa those fantasy fathers we admired on our television screens. They become men who can give unconditional love. So I do not have, thank you. I don't, I don't have any children, but I am in one sense, an uncle. Um, and a godfather. And one thing, you know, my nieces and nephews play cousins, my god, my godchild knows if you know god daddy comes through, we're gonna play. We're gonna have some, we gonna have some fun. Tell me all your stories. You know, we're gonna run around the living room. We'll do all of that type of thing. Whatever it is, we're 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 there. And I can think of my father not that was not necessarily there for most of that part when I was younger. But very much like Bell Hooks, my father in his later later years, we had it out. And I had the language to be able to tell my father about uh, hurt and about softness. And the, the toughest thing to ever tell my father was like, Dad, you are the first man to break my heart. And that was very hard to say. And so out of that, we had a lot of other discussions. And in the end, he still... Is who he's going to be. This way, it wasn't an Antoine Fisher moment. Everybody was happy and we embraced. But towards the end of his life, was probably the most vulnerable I've seen my father physically and 
I got to see a lot of that emotion that either he did not have or could not express, you know, at the time. And so that takes me back to one last part of the section, which is uh, doing the work of love. And whenever I think about bell hooks, of course, Toni Morrison as well is a part of it. So there's a section that says, and more importantly, to sustain a vision of loving relationships rooted, rooted in mutuality, a vision that says there is enough love for all of us. Our needs can be met and our longings fulfilled. This is the love Toni Morrison evokes in her 80s novel, Beloved. When she creates an image of the black male healer of the wounded hearts, able to take the broken bits and pieces that I am and give them back to me in all the right order. One of my favorite characters is Paul D. Um, because he is kind of the character that has that moment where he he finally open he had he has no choice but to open his heart. That whole part in the book where he says red heart, red heart, that like gets me all the time. And so I have a series of poems written in the voices of the sweet home men on the plantation in Beloved. And so this is a, a poem in the voice of the character Sixo, uh, the one who, who was brought over um, but hadn't been socialized into, you know, into plantation life. He didn't even really try to speak English. So he was in love with 30 Mile Woman, which is a woman who lived in a plantation 30 miles away. And this is what I came up with. 30 Mile Woman, 6 -oh song. I asked the wind for guidance. In this place, the trees know me now. Earth is still earth, but black-eyed Susans do not differ so much from African violets. They want me to speak the two-bob talk, stop the dancing so I may not find myself. When I am lost, you find me. Gather me when I am pieces. Gather me, love the pieces that I am. Bring me back to me in all the right order, friend of my mind. I have asked permission of all creation to let us meet. Time is your hard breath in the field. I move when the wind wills it. We have tomorrow and today. 30 mile woman, meet me at the crossroads. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, bell hooks helped me to gather language that I needed or that I already had and to not be afraid. And sometimes revealing the tenderness is also very radical and revolutionary, unfortunately, among Black men. And so I'll close with one other thing. Being a teacher, some of the hardest thing to do is to see your students and you want to try to help them all, but you can see some of them slipping or falling or being pulled. And so I think about, you know, my boys, you know, my black boys and the tender and them observing tenderness or seeing it leave them, you know, you know, especially when kids hit middle school. And so this is called the moment we lose them. And this is for my cousin's son, who's like my nephew, um, very much my nephew. And it's about seeing his tenderness going and hoping that it stays. So I'll close with this. The moment we lose them. My nephew is shocked when his mother places kisses on my cheeks. He's only seen his mama kiss his daddy. And he frowns, then runs to tell his grandma, ooh, ooh, mommy kiss Derek. Then stares at me like I stole the training wheels off his bike. His mama walks over, grabs him up, plants rapid fire kisses all over his face. He smiles and laughs and relents after putting up the weakest fight ever and is relieved. Even his stare down with me has softened. So I walk over and ask, you still mad? And he gives a small nod. And then I say, maybe you're mad because you didn't get a kiss from me. He leans back from me, hands up near his face, says, boys don't kiss boys. And though he kisses his father, I, the out of town uncle, gets no such pass. But it wasn't that long ago he was a boy that hugged with abandon and offered up his then baby face for kisses and nuzzles. And I believe in children deciding for themselves who to allow into their personal space. So I would never press him for a kiss or a hug, but it is such a loss that tenderness be parceled or chipped away from the boys, these budding shoots pruned of softness early. And it's a sad understanding 
that softness may mean target, no matter the chromosomal collection, that soon our hugs will be bolstered by forearms that protect our chest from closeness or quick daps and chest bumps. And I don't know how I kept my tender. The men in my family were builders with hands that were rough, but still cupped and cuddled, stirred broth and gravy smoothly and showed me care with calloused hands. Even my now you see him, now you don't dad always gave me kisses and parting, which stings all the more because I crave his ability to take up space for a time. I hope when I have children of my own, we'll be able to stave off this pruning of tenderness. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bell Hooks. Thank you, Beyond Baroque. Thank you, Shonda. Thank you, Pam. Everyone, thank you. Yay. <laughs> Everyone, thank you, Shonda, for inviting me. Thank you, Beyond Baroque, for having me back. Thank you to all the wonderful poets I have a chance to finally connect with again. I feel like I'm finally home. I really appreciate it. Um, I encountered Bell Hooks when I was at school at UCSD. And um, this was one of the first assignments that I was given. We were in a class with Princey Troop, who was my mentor. And you know, he made sure that we read Bell Hooks. And so I'm reading from an excerpt from backwards, Black Looks, Race and Representation. And the rest of my presentation is really going to be sort of an imaginary dialogue between uh, Bell and myself in somewhat of a stream of conscious, um, baby, you know, I was high when I wrote this kind of thing. So uh, bear with me here. So Bell writes, years ago, I attended a small gathering of black women who were meeting to plan a national conference on black feminism. As we sat in a circle talking about our experiences, those individuals who were most listened to all told stories of how brutally they have been treated by the, the black community. Speaking against the construction of a monolithic experience, I talked about the way my experience of black community differed sharing that I had been raised in a segregated rural black community that was very supportive. Our segregated church and schools were places where I felt affirmed. I was continually told that I was special in those settings, that I would someday be somebody and do important work to uplift the race. I felt loved and cared about in the segregated black community of my growing up. It gave me the grounding in a positive experience of blackness that sustained me when I left that community to enter racially integrated settings where racism informed most social interactions. Before I could finish speaking, I was interrupted by one of those famous black women present who chastised me for trying to erase another black woman's pain by bringing up a different experience. Her voice was hostile and angry. She began by saying she was sick of people like me. I felt silenced and, under, and misunderstood. It seemed that the cathartic expression of collective pain wiped out any chance that my insistence on the diversity of Black experience would be heard. When I was in school, I had this um, experience time and time again where there was a sort of essential black woman and it had absolutely nothing to do with me. I would, would spend time kind of sneaking around the back corners of the liter literature department as a visual artist and a performance artist and my thoughts were not welcome and my perspective were not particularly welcome because people just couldn't get this artsy chick. And so when I read this part, this passage from Bell Hooks, I was like, yeah, she totally understands me. This is great. You know, where do I get more? And then Quincy assigned um, All About Love New Vision. So I was like, and since I had permission to curse, I was like, damn, not, man, not, that's this, what? I'm not trying to do this. So this is my introduction um, into this dialogue, this imaginary dialogue that I have with Bell Hooks. And I'm the elder, go figure. I hate the investigation of love. The idea that I must follow myself, allow myself to be vulnerable in order to embrace love. I can and do risk my sense of physical and mental well being every day in the line of duty, confronting people who feel they have no stake in the social contract of wellness and respect. But I guard my love fiercely. 
because though my heart can be rescued and reconstituted at will, if I lose love, I am doomed. Bell, full stop, stifle mode, wait until the waiting is over, then rewrite your reality. Find something more compelling than habit or fear. Age distill your essence. There are more pieces of you, fractures and flecks in you. You've contracted into atoms, expanded through galaxies, yet you're whole. Looking back at Belle, I realized that I read her book all about love, new visions in grad school at a time when, I, when my invincibility was in question. My heart was shattered and I would have none of it. This call to love, these instructions on sustaining love, when the man I loved had left with everything except my diaries, devastating to leave behind the story of your lover's life, so insignificant, so damning, but to lay claim to her furniture, but not her history. So I read what was necessary to fulfill my professor's requirements, and I gave that damn book away as soon as I could find a sucker willing to read it. But now I'm calling in the ancestors and I call in Belle and I see her ringing the chimes of justice, freedom, happiness. She is a radical siren of black love. I want to celebrate blackness that doesn't swallow us whole into a monolith of cultural identity. So my Caribbean grandparents who were called monkey chasers and coconut niggers by Southern blacks can Calypso dance with rum in their hands. Now, I call in selflessness, selflessness that demands a moment of silence for lost love. For years, I accessorized my self-loathing with accolades, years in, of stuffy, in-color coordinated institutions that don't match my eyes. I smiled at legacy babies buying degrees as the intellectual security guards directed me to the affirmative action sale rack, not believing a sister like me with my dark skin could have had the currency of a privileged past. Daily, I encounter people who view my agency and authority as an abomination, people who want me dead, who are ready and able to claim self-defense if they shoot me in the back or enter my home under the guise of security. I wonder how long before I slap my cards down on the table and raise or cuss? How long can you skirt around the edge without falling, linger on the precipice without being pushed, turn into flash paper flame and cinder? The revolution of 2020 came too late for me. I asked for justice, and it came as a muffled curse, a smug frat boy apology behind bulletproof glass. I, I was too busy to protest. I, I was following Pistorius, who was following Shorter down a polyrhythmic rabbit hole, and, and that's why I missed a revolution. I got a round face ghost zooming me, casket closed, COVID caught him, grief ambushed me, and, and that's why I, I missed a revolution. I was bursting, nerves confetti at a whisper. I was tickling genius, coaxing a light divine. I was cycling in and out of sanity increasingly rapidly, and that's why I missed the rebellion. The echo in the melon wasn't right yet. Girl, I just paid for these teeth. My knee clicks. Activism on the cusp of Medicare B is a delicate shuffle. It's fetal position Friday, baby. And my onesie reads fight the power, but I don't have the time. Nothing is pure, save my first words of the day. First words yesterday were don't let them hurt me. Them being the Victorian Jumbie on the apocalyptic Escher staircase coming to take my soul. When ghosts share your head, they jambalaya speak over one another, rat-a-tat-tat -tat whispers like buckshot, painful, scarring, pathetic, not making any sense. Have I broken a covenant bell? Why do some bear or wear a diadem and others wear a crown of thorns? Bell, I am speaking, but you refuse to hear. My name, my voice, my presence confronts the invisibility that, com that comforts you. Your inability to see me was your choice, not my burden. Attempt to walk through me again. I dare you. Try that again. 
elder. You haven't done it and you won't succeed. In the catbird seat, watching you plot, trying to disappear me, turn back a clock, set hellfire to my skin and roast your s'mores on my chest. You want to be bigger than a son of man, eclipse my existence, but keep everything I've built for you. You haven't done it and you won't succeed. The ashes of your victims fertilized me. I got wisdom seeded by bullets. And ooh, baby, the crop's coming in strong. Don't need much light coming up through the cracks. Been well watered. Won't wait for permission to bloom. You want to gift me with deadly blankets, pin Tuskegee medals on my uniform and numbered tattoos, branded tattoos and black teardrops. You want me to flame out in my orange jumpsuit before the parachute is deploys. Step on my neck until I expire. You can do it. You could probably get away with it. We both know it. But this war you're baiting, this uncivil divide between races, the finish line is a cliff. For me and my Black friends, we got butterfly wings. We got eagle wings. We got angel wings. And we soar. So why am I still here? without all the things that common sense beliefs say make life worthwhile. This is what I chose. Loneliness and the fear of intimacy so intense, I won't even bond with tropical fish. This is what a barren, creative, intelligent, but shy woman has to look forward to. Are you saying the only thing that will get me out of this rut is my talent for making things, for writing, for singing? The only thing that will keep me from slipping off the earth unnoticed is a legacy of art. And even then, only a few people will ever see or know who I am. I can live with that. Bell, the pillars have fallen, girl, and new thrones have been erected. The beaver moon is blood red tonight. A shooting star flew by unnoticed and you were branded with an invisible, unpronounceable silent name. Your name is wonder. Your lore is wonderful. Understanding is overrated. The moment is. The breath is. You are ether clinging to earth and you've been mistaken for human. I've been cycling in and out of sanity, cycling even more rapidly, I clutch the purse I don't have against my imaginary waistline, protective of a legacy I don't have, mason jar quarter full of she-boss aspirations mixed with 40 acres of fear, sweaty ponds between here and hail Mary, hallelujah. I'm pivoting, I'm twirling, I'm moving, and the ancestors ring ambrosia for my weeping heart. Cherished ones cue up behind me, hands subtle touch the small of my back, gentle as a hug from the wind. I've traveled centuries with one step, but I need permission before entering the four corners of my blood. I'm waiting for the sun's introduction. My spirit name means humble. My footsteps are prayers. I hear their skeletons languishing between History's warped yellow pages, pressed flowers scented with suffering. My soul aches for the nameless, eager to pass over, passing beneath my features, my face indistinguishable from theirs. I understand this lost language of orphans. They say, you belong to us. Our longing fleshes out your bones. Each generation is a kaleidoscope of genes made from common colored shards. You've got your grandfather's crooked lip. You got your abuela's childbearing hips. While you were still in her womb, your mother got sugar from your father because he loved the honeys. You inherited your mama's bunions from dancing in high heels. And I dance, boy, do I fucking dance. 
I dance like those bones that sway deep in the ocean. I dance for the shackled and beaten, the caged and stolen. I dance for the peacocks and dandies who tailored their identities and scraps of hand-me-down dream coats. I dance for the doctors who became nannies when they crossed under the Statue of Liberty's torch, for the laborers whose calluses built empires on streets paved with fool's gold. And I dance for Bell. I sing for Bell. I shout for Bell. I fight for Bell. I live and I thrive, shaded by the umbrella of your tribulations and your blessings. Thank you. Thank you, Bell Hooks. I have to unmute and say, Lord have mercy, girl. I got to Amen, amen. One, two, three. Wow. Damn. 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 God. The buzzer. That was so beautiful. Oh my gosh. Thank you all so much for having me here. And I don't even know how I'm going to follow all of the amazingness that <laughs> came before me. Um, I thank you so much to Shonda and Jimmy uh, and Quinn and everybody here who had a part in bringing us all here. Um, this has been amazing. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me all to be here with you. Um, yeah. And uh, like, a lot of other people, I also encountered Bell Hooks as um, a student, as an undergrad. I'm still a student. I'll probably be a lifetime student. <laughs> um, and uh, I had the opportunity, uh, amazing honor to go to Spelman as an undergrad. And so Spelman was really the kind of uh, the path that led me to uh, get to know Bell and her words. Um, and particularly my mentor, um, was Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftal, who was also a really good sister friend of Bell Hooks. Um, and so I read Bell Hooks all throughout those four years at Spalman, um, but I also got to have the opportunity of spending time with Bell Hooks in Puerto Rico for the National Women's Studies Association Conference um, in 2014. And Bell Hook, for folks who um, ever got to encounter her, she was just someone who was just so open and willing to bring students in. It didn't matter, you know, who you were, where you were, where you came from, um, just the way that she spoke to you and welcomed you. It was like you had known her before, a family, as a family member, as a, a deep friend. And I feel like that was just kind of the spirit that she carried and just, even the couple of times that I got to meet her and the way that she greeted me and always made me feel like the work that I was doing um, was worth it and valuable. Um, it's something I think I'll ever take with me. Um, and then I also just loved how much she enjoyed celebrating and you know having parties. And I remember distinctly uh, how she would invite all the grad students along with other folks to come uh, to her uh, hotel suite. She had this really huge hotel suite that she would invite folks in to come have snacks and come have wine. And that was, it was just always a joy to also see, you know, she, you know, celebrated and played just as hard as she wrote. And she uh, produced so much for us and we have so much um, of her words and her words to carry us through um, and to know that at the same time she placed just as much emphasis on play and joy um, is something that I think that I will continue to remember, um, you know, in my own work and um, I have several of her books with me, but I think one book that continues to stay with me that I'll read from is Sisters of the Yam, um, Black Women and Self-Recovery. Um, and this book means particularly a lot to me because um, while at Spelman um, for a semester, I ended up doing like a, a Black women's therapy slash healing space for a semester. So about 10 weeks or so, um, I got to do nothing but talk about this book with other Black women and it was incredible. Um, and we got to sit with eight chapters every week um, with a professor named Dr. Lonnie Jones, who is also um, a Black feminist uh, mental health advocate and therapist um, who works at um, the University of Albany. Um, and so being able to kind of really unpack 
this work in the presence of other Black women who were also really invested and interested in how we could talk about healing um, amongst ourselves and in our communities was something that I don't think I'll ever, ever forget. Um, and so much of how I've kind of approached my own healing journey comes from this work. And particularly the passage I want to read about is, um, you know, Bell Hooks kind of thinking about um, this inclination Black women, particularly also Black women in her family, had to work all the time. Um, and I think now, um, as someone who is uh, coming up in the academy and understanding just kind of the precarious nature that Black women um, occupy, not only in the academy, but in any occupation and job we have, this idea um, that work has to be the sole center of our lives and not rest and not taking care of our health and not sleeping. Um, and I think, you know, she has a whole chapter dedicated to talking to Black women about rest, which I think in itself is so beautiful and so radical and something um, we don't hear enough, but shout out to uh, those who are also, um, you know, followers of the NAP ministry. Um, the NAP minister does a lot to remind us how important um, rest is for our collective health, for our individual health. Um, and for our communal health. And Bell Hooks was also someone who made sure to remind us and let us know that as well. In a society that socializes everyone to believe that black women were put here on this earth to be little worker bees who never stop, it is not surprising that we too have trouble calling a halt. When my five sisters and I left home to set up our households, one of the first things we noticed about mom was how she never stopped working. She was continuing a pattern set by her mother who spent a lifetime getting up at the crack of dawn to begin the day's work. Mama's mother used to sell fishing worms and liked to fish herself. And I can remember them finding her when she was in her 80s, where she had fallen down by the creek trying to dig worms and fish. In part, these generations of Southern Black people were so desperate to let the racist white world know that they were not quote unquote lazy, that they were compulsive about work. Had not slavery socialized the generations before them to be compulsive about work? Had not being farmers, working the land meant long days of hard labor. The compulsive need we see in our mom always to be busy, never to be resting. She has high blood pressure, is disturbing. And yet many of us have adopted a similar life pattern. We do not know when to quit. Knowing when to quit is linked to knowing one's value. If black women have not learned to value our bodies, then we cannot respond fully to endangering them by undue stress. Since society rewards us most, indicates that we are valuable, when we are willing to push ourselves to the limit and beyond, we need a life-affirming practice, a counter system of valuation in order to resist this agenda. Most Black women have not yet developed a counter system. And so I read this because Bell Hooks was my counter system. She was part of me developing my own kind of counter politic to this idea that I needed to um, kind of work myself to the bone for um, a reward. But the idea that, you know, I can continue to um, pour energy and pour things into um, that give me energy, that give me life, those are things that are valuable. Those are things worth living for. Um, and so I thank Bell Hooks for the work that she did to, these were words that I also got to share with my mom. Um, me and my mom get to talk about this book a lot. And I think that was another thing that I really appreciated about Bell Hooks was just how accessible um, her work is so that I get to go home to Lumberton, North Carolina um, and talk about um, these critical words with the women who mean most to me in my life. Um, and so the poem that I wanted to share um, was particularly inspired by um, my Southern upbringing and um, things that was what I felt most connected to with Bell Hooks, um, both being from the South, both being from a black, rural Black South, um, and having that take up so much space in how we read the world, how we read the world, how we move through the world. Um, and um, this poem that I'm gonna read is called Santee, um, South Carolina, um, which is really thinking about um, ancestry. And that was also something that Bell Hooks talks a lot about in her work, um, this appreciation, this veneration, this honor of our ancestors and those who come before us. Um, she stressed it as much as possible. And she was someone who made me 
um, deeply, deeply proud of my Black and Lumbee roots, my family, um, and just being, um, you know, taking up space uh, as a Southern person. Um, she talks a lot about kind of the, um, uh, I guess you could say, uh, ideas that people have about folks from the South, and she flips them on their heads. Um, and so I'm really appreciative um, of the work that she does, um, just and has done uh, around so many things. Um, so yeah, so here's Santi. One, let the bourbon burn, light fire, get saved, waded by the water, but don't come out like you did going in. Spanish moss low and hanging, swaying whispered prayers, feeling mama's voice running blue rifts through my veins. Lord, keep me near the river, for the river knows my name. Two, sweat beads mingle with sweet inklings off a stem. Salted crimson stains must have made a hell of a mark. A ball partially closed, made for thorn prick fingers. How else to let folks know you breathe this earth and to leave your print in blood? Three, these ghosts won't let you live in your unjustified peace. These ghosts won't make you remember. These ghosts will make you remember. My ghosts will bring my children to riddle your unchucked comfort. My children will bear the sacred grounds of our casted spirits. They'll carry with them these words they've molded as compass to guide their hands through soil, still drenched in my tears. My children will insist on the unearthing of our truths, tried, tired, and twisted, left to be forgotten. Um, and that's the first poem um, that I wanted to read. And again, uh, I feel like it, uh, I feel like Bell Hooks does a lot to really kind of, um, you know, dispel a lot of myths around what it means to be uh, Black and Southern um, and a woman and a feminist um, uh, now and also generations before. Um, the next poem that I'll read is a, a golden shovel poem. Um, and I feel like it was a golden shovel poem that I did after Tracy Morris's Project Princess, um, but I feel like the image um, that uh, Tracy Morris um, kind of invokes and the image that I invoke um, is of a woman who really, in you know, simple terms, didn't take any shit. And we know through Bell Hooks' words and also um, for you know, in encounters with her, she didn't take any shit, and she also um, you know didn't allow you to. Uh, not be uh, your best, most critical self. And that's something that I think as an educator, um, as someone who uh, is teaching undergrads, um, that is something that I will also continue to have in my practice and in my pedagogy. Um, and so this is uh, um, a go to show a poem after Project Princess, Her Hands Mobile Thrones. Um, the line that I'm taking this from is Her Hands Mobile Thrones of Today's Urban Goddess. Clinking rings, link, dragon fingers, no need to be modest. Don't try to remember her or plant kisses on her hands. Her heart, graceful and mobile, dances on your cardboard thrones. She knows what wounds are made of, fleshed out and open, unmoved by today's world, make you say what you mean by urban. Dare you to see, say black, feel the goddess living in her rib cage, clinking round her dancing heart. Haunting sirens, howling winds, her voice rings, lifting notes off pages, the link between a heaven out there and her homemade universe. What dragon dares to know the fire in her bones, on her fingers, electrifying to the touch? This is no myth. She exists without the need of your acknowledgement. Her love too fierce to wait for your pleading. She be no exotic be girl to your fantasy. She be real, always stepping correct. She joins in a black girl chorus to say, Psh, please, fuck your modesty. Thank you so much. Oh, can yeah. we just unmute and say yes? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Everyone, oh my goodness oh, this has North been Carolina. yes right. oh, yeah. nc yeah. nc yeah. heritage yeah. samson <laughs> county relatives i <laughs> am so incredibly grateful to everyone and i know that we were yes f your modesty <laughs> nancy lee <laughs> I know we were supposed to have time for Q&A, but um, I think we, uh, I don't think we have time for Q&A because it was just so rich 
Uh, so I'm just going to end with the last poem of Bell Hooks's first book. And this is called The Last Song. Within my hands, I hold the magic seed. Let us eat and drink together. Our time will not be long. Within my voice, I carry the magic sound, our song of sorrow, our dance of praise. Within my heart, I house the hidden flower, fragrance of morning, dew of nightfall, that we may sleep sound, remembering always this time together. And that is the, I mean, the most appropriate way to end this honoring for Bell Hooks. Um, thank you, rest in power, sis. And to every seed that you planted, we are anticipating the buds and the flowers that grow. Thank you to these amazing writers. Thank you so very much. Yes, we will try to anthologize this. And there is a recording, Quentin, correct? There is a, it's a recording, I believe it's on YouTube. So you will be able to see it. Thanks so much to everyone who participated and all the attendees. I'm so Thank grateful. You. Thank Until you, the you. next one, I hope, I say, amen. Thank you, Shana. <laughs> Bye, Pam. Bye, bye Pam. Pam. Bye, Pat. Bye. Bye, bye Doug. Bye, bye, Derek. Bye, buddy. <laughs> bye, 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 love bye, bye, love bye, all bye. of you guys. Love you all. All the fire. Uh, great. Great Shonda night. started it off. Shonda, you got it started right yep. there. I was like, oh, there it is. There's the bar. <laughs> it's bringing it. You know, that's how I was taught. I was taught. <laughs> No, right. I, I don't want to push my leave, but I don't want to leave either. Seriously. I'm on spring break this, month, this week, right. so what I can I can just stay on all week. Oh. No, thank you all. Thank Until you the so next much. time. Until the next time. All right, guys. Nice Bye, to Shonda. You congratulations, Shonda. Congratulations. Many congrats. Thank and you. The great direction that you had in us in at Beyond Baroque. So I appreciate you. Let thank me know. Thank you so I'm much. Running. I will. <laughs> And Absolutely. Stay, and Shonda, stay on that throne, girl. I, I'm I'm trying. I'm trying. My time, my duration. I'm trying. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so okay. much. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Nice. Thanks, meeting, everyone. everyone. Take care, everyone. Right, cousin Derek, be good. All right, cousin. I will. Well, holler soon, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right.